So drought is not something that people create on their own. And so it's not something they're selected into. But here we have drought, which comes along and hits counties sort of at random. So we use the, the data almost like a natural experiment. And you look at that across many counties, you can sort of get a sense of whether the drought really drives health in a way. And then we can also try to examine whether or not variations in policy uh, mitigate any. Our goal is to see whether the, the wellness programs and the clinics and the chronic disease management programs, has that improved not only the health of the teachers, but also their ability to increase the knowledge of their students. The overall goal of our project is to evaluate a natural experiment in how food has been delivered over the last few years in Dallas County. In Dallas County alone, there are 500,000 people who are food insecure. That's one in five of everyone and one in five of all the children. That's really striking. These are people who experience um, worse health. They have three times the rate of depression and they have two more days every month where they have poor physical health. We're able to link people to their electronic medical records. Of those, 20% had an emergency room visit. That's very, very high. That's really shocking and really kind of speaks to the fact of why this is really important. The community where you live has the biggest impact on health as opposed to even hereditary or what happens in the doctor's office. And what our research project is about is to look at the health outcomes on low-income residents in that community. So the um, Housing Authority in Seattle is working with public health in the center of Seattle. There is a public housing development that's been there since 1940 and we are completely redeveloping that public housing development. And what our research project is about is to look at the health outcomes on low-income residents in that community and how our redevelopment strategies may or may not have influenced those health outcomes. So a novel policy change occurred in Oregon in 2009. And what this policy did was it expanded access to prenatal care for a group of women who previously denied, denied it based on our immigration status. So what we're collaborating on together is really looking at how this policy change affected health outcomes and utilization of care for those women as well as their subsequent children. In Oregon circumstance, women in particular counties were given access to the program over time. And so we use that staggered rollout as a quasi-experiment uh, in order to estimate the effect of the program both on mother and child. For example, a woman I took care of was a really lovely woman who'd moved to the United States within the past three years, had a few other children and had significant type 2 diabetes. She needed insulin and different medications to keep her sugars under control. She didn't have access to prenatal care and had only very basic access to get her diabetic supplies. This led to her having a child born with a really significant congenital heart defect, which could have been prevented and managed um, simply through better glucose control during her prenatal care. But she was denied that simply because of where she was born and the timing of her arrival to the United States. So the United States has the world's largest incarceration rate of industrialized nations, which has led to five million children experiencing parental incarceration, including one in four African American children. So we want to understand how the experiences of our criminal justice system are impacting the health and well-being of our children in our communities. Judges and district attorneys have a large amount of discretion in the decisions that they make. We hope that the evidence that we find will influence the way judges and prosecutors um, make decisions about sentencing and even processing. The desert of Eloy, Arizona. We visited in uh, August. It was a single mother with two young kids. They were essentially living in a roped off little part of their living room where a very small window air conditioner was. The rest of the home reached temperatures of upwards of 140 degrees. So totally uninhabitable. And the kids suffered from nosebleeds and so on. And so when the weatherization program came in and uh, fixed the home and you know added insulation and air sealing and ventilation and so on. They could use their entire mobile home 
and the kids nosebleed stop. You know, they will go back to school. And energy savings and energy cost savings is the main goal of the program. If you monetize the health benefits, it may be two or three times the energy savings benefits. We've been talking about the importance of social determinants of health and how um, all these factors that are in our lives from healthcare, but really um, where we live, our, our workplace, our education, safety, all of these things impact health. The, the grants that we support both are addressing important social issues and social determinants of health, but they're also being rigorously evaluated. We can really contribute to the development of a culture of health in the U.S. and really change from a time when, when we talked about health policy, it was only health care policy, to really thinking about health policy as the things that really drive our health, which, as we know, happen mostly outside the clinic.